We're going to read uh, a little bit today from God's Word with regard to a, a man, um, his name was Joseph, or Joseph, but he had a nickname. Uh, when I was growing up, my, my real name's Austin Blake Brinkerhoff Jr., but uh, I was called Audie. Anybody here ever had a nickname? <laughs> nicknames, Danny, okay, others had nicknames? Well, we're going to read about Barnabas. Uh, Barnabas was not his real name. It was a nickname that he got. And the word Barnabas means son of encouragement. And that's what the apostles gave this man. Now when the apostles give you a nickname because of what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life, that's pretty strong, isn't it? That says something. That says something. Listen, listen to little, just a little bit about his story today. And it certainly applies to each and every one of us. All the believers were one in heart and mind. And by the way, excuse me, forgive me. This, this happened shortly after Pentecost as the church was, was forming. Okay? All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own. But they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and much grace was upon them all. There were no needy persons among them, for from time to time those who owned lands or houses sold them and brought the money from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone as he had need. Joseph a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, was, which means son of encouragement, sold the field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. All right, that's one thing we know about the son of encouragement, Barnabas. Now we turn to Acts chapter 15, 36 to 41. Now, this is Paul's second missionary journey. Very, very brief background. I'll get to it in a minute, a little bit more. But uh, on, first, on Paul's first missionary journey, he took with him, uh, wanted to take with him a young man named Mark, actually John Mark. And um, Mark bailed on him. He bailed on him. He left. We, we don't know why. We don't know if he was afraid or what, or, you know. We don't know why, but he, he bailed he bailed on Paul and the other apostles that were with Paul in the first missionary journey. So, we're coming now to the second missionary journey, and you're going to, here comes, here comes Barnabas again, because Paul and Barnabas are very close. Oh, and by the way, just a little snippet if you're ever at a party, Barnabas and John Mark were cousins, if you didn't know that. Just, you know. A little trivial pursuit right there, if you want to know. Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left, commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray, please. Well, there's an old story about a, a preacher who was leaving a, a church. He'd been the pastor there for several years, and the uh, the church was having a fellowship dinner for him, a goodbye dinner for him, and um, at that dinner, a, a, a dear lady named. Uh, Doris, and she was just crying her eyes out, crying and crying and crying and crying and crying, and the preacher felt really sorry for her, and so he went over to her and he said, don't be so sad, please don't be sad, I mean, who knows, the next preacher might be even better than me, 
And she looked at it and replied, oh yeah, right, that's what they've been saying all the time, all the time, all the time, but it keeps getting worse and worse and worse. <laughs> Now that was not an encouraging thing to hear, was it? Fact is, life can be very challenging, can't it? Life can be very discouraging at times, can't it? For most of us, we need a lot of help along the way. Would you agree with that? We Christians face so many challenges in our daily lives at virtually up every turn that it's important for us to have people in our lives that will support us and help us. And I'm here today to tell you, that they're sitting in these chairs right here, and there are many who are not able to be here who will do just that. We all need encouragement, all of us. Think about it. What do people need when they are struggling? Encouragement, right? What do people need when they need to be challenged to do something that may be too big for them, too large for them, too much for them to accomplish or handle? Encouragement, right? What does a person who is struggling with their faith need from other people? Encouragement. They don't need a reprimand, do they? They don't need to, to have somebody get in their face and say, Come on, man, come on, woman, hold firm. Come on, you know, come on. What are you, what's wrong with you? They don't need, need to be scolded for their doubts, do they? No. They need support. They need guidance. They need nurture. And they need encouragement. William Arthur Ward once said this. He said, quote, Flatter me, and I may not believe you. Criticize me, and I may not like you. Ignore me, and I may not forgive you. Encourage me, and I will not forget you. See, the truth of the matter is, is that offering encouragement to other people, especially in the church, the Bible makes that very clear especially in the Church of Jesus Christ, in this community of faith here at Christ United Fellowship. Offering encouragement to others, to somebody who needs it, can literally change a person's life. And that is why today we are going to emphasize the importance of encouraging each other, encouraging each other, encouraging Sharon with with. You know, the patience that, that, that you're, you're, you're wanting to have so much, and Randy as well, and encouraging other people like Tina with what your friend is going through right now, encouraging Peggy with, with her husband Charlie and who's going through so much, and encouraging Rebecca, encouraging Dave, encouraging Nina, encouraging Steve, Beth, you know, encouraging Gracia, Dave, Pat, encouraging us all, encouraging Kristen. What a beautiful wife. Encouraging me. We all need it. So I ask you, what is encouragement? When we say we are encouraging another person, what does that really mean? It's deeper than you may think. Are we encouraging someone who will yell at them or tell them that they're not going to amount to anything in life? Of course not. And you know what's sad? There's far too many parents, mainly fathers these days, who, start, who say that stuff to their kids. Is being critical of everything being an encourager or not? Of course not. So what does it mean to be an encourager? Well, first it means that we seek to help other people instead of hurt other people. We seek to help them, not hurt them. Now that sounds basic, that sounds trite for, for we Christians. But there are a lot of people out there in the world in which we live who don't look at life like that. <clears throat> a great example is a man in scripture and his friends nicknamed him the son of encouragement. As I said earlier, his name was Hoses, Hoses or Joseph. Joseph. Um, that's his real name. Acts chapter 4, 36 and 37, we read, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the, the, the apostles, the apostles, not the disciples, the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now this was at least one of the acts that earned Barnabas his name. 
Barnabas, again, whose real name was Joseph or Joseph, was a wealthy Levite from the island of Cyprus. He sold a piece of property that belonged to him, obviously, and he gave the money to the church to care for its poorer members. Now that's putting teeth into your encouragement. You see, that's doing more of the talk than the talk, isn't it? That's putting your encouragement into action. See, there's a difference between saying, oh, you know, I, I want to get, it's going to get better. I'm going to be by your side, and then not doing anything. As opposed to telling somebody, giving them encouragement, telling somebody that, you know, things are going to get better, and I'm going to help make it better. God's going to help make it better. We're going to get through this through His grace, through His power, through His presence, and doing it. And that's what Barnabas did, and that's one reason why the apostles gave him that nickname. A little while later, we read about Barnabas offering encouraging words, but here we see once again that he also did encouraging deeds. You see, when you offer words of encouragement and follow them up with encouraging deeds, somebody always benefits. An American psychologist, John Gottman, found that spouses who give spouses who give six positive comments to one negative have much, 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 much stronger marriages. Six positive comments to one negative. It would be great if we can all get rid of the negative. It's just not that realistic. I hope you can. But six positive comments. And you can see how encouragement plays out in the real world. Let me give you an example. This is a true example. A woman went to work one day and she brought her newborn baby with her and her seven-year-old son. And of course, everybody in the office was ooing and aahing over the branding, the newborn little beautiful little baby. And, and the seven-year-old son asked, said, Mommy, can I have some money to buy a soda? And the mother replied, Well, what do you say? What do you say? And he replied by looking in her eyes. He said, Mama, you are beautiful. <laughs> well, the woman reached into her purse and gave her son the money, not just for one soda, but two sodas. <laughs> now, if that's true in the business world, and that's true in the home, do you suppose that being an encourager rather than a discourager might be a valuable gift in the church? Yeah. yeah. Hebrews 13.3 tells us this, so please listen carefully. It says, encourage one another daily. Read it for yourself, Hebrews 3.13. Encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Now what this is telling us is that encouragement means more than telling someone something that will lift their spirits. That's important. However, Christian encouragement is something that we are in which we are called to look out for each other. And when a brother or sister gets out of step with the Lord, then one way or another, we are to encourage them. We are to encourage them, not scold them. Encourage them to get back on track. We are accountable to each other. In other words, the encouraging Christian does more than tell you what you want to hear. The encouraging Christian urges you, appeals to you. An encouraging Christian will tell you what you need to hear. Not in a caustic manner. Not in, in negative, unloving terms, but in loving terms. Not hurtful terms. Encouraging Christians don't do this because they think that they're better than you are, or that I am, or that they're holier than thou. They do it because they love you and they believe in you through the Holy Spirit of Jesus Christ. They see your potential, and because of that potential, 
They urge and appeal to you to become more, to become better than what you have been, what I have been. But they don't do it in such a way that puts you down. Their goal, our goal, is not to hurt, but help. So point number one is an encourager seeks to help others rather than hurt them. Point number two is an encourager sacrifices for other people. Again, Barnabas is a great example. We all remember the, the story of Paul's meeting with Jesus on the road to Damascus in Acts chapter 9, right? We all, we all know that by heart. Well, and we know his baptism uh, in Christ by Ananias a few days later, right? But few people realize how hard a time Paul had living down his past. You see, the reason Paul was on the road to Damascus was to do what? To persecute and imprison Christians. The Bible tells us that he literally dragged, he must have been a big guy. And he had a group around with him. The Bible tells us that he literally dragged them out of their houses and took them to jail. This was what Paul was known for. His name was Saul back then. That's what he was known for. And for years, Paul was the face, the literal face of Christian persecution. Acts chapter 3 tells us that he went from house to house and he dragged Christians out of their homes and put them in prison. Everybody, brothers and sisters, everybody knew who Paul had been. His reputation as a Christian persecutor was known throughout the entire general world at that time. Even after Paul was baptized, that's still how people viewed him. And who could blame him, right? Well, he wanted to meet with the apostles after his conversion. But Acts chapter 9, 26 and 27 tells us that when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him. Can you blame him? Not believing that he was a real disciple. Can you blame him? Nope. But get this. In spite of all that, in spite of all that wretched, evil history, Barnabas, Barnabas, the son of encouragement that we read about earlier, brought him to the apostles, stood up for him. He told them how Saul, on his journey uh, to Damascus, how the Lord had, had changed him, spoken to him, and, and that the, that how on that Damascus road that, that, that God had, had moved him from one direction to another, and how Paul, in Damascus now, where he was supposed to drag these Christians and imprison them, he says that he preached fearlessly in Jesus' name. Imagine that for a second. You're supposed to be dragging Christians out of their home. That's what you're known for. You hate them. You hate them. And so you're dragging them and you're putting them in jail. And guess what God does with Paul? He goes to Damascus and instead of dragging Christians and putting them in jail, what does he do? He preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to them. How amazing is that? Wow. Can you imagine the people <laughs> there who were, whoa, 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 what's going on here? What? What? Well, you're supposed to be driving Christians to put them in jail, and, and, and here you're telling us the good news, that, they, that, that, that they're right, that their faith is true, that you were wrong. See, Barnabas didn't have to do that. Barnabas didn't have to take Paul before the apostles and stand up for him. He didn't have to put his reputation on the line and possibly his friendship on the line with the apostles for this once vicious, evil, cruel, sick man. But he did it. He did it. And the result, what's the result of him doing that? It was through him that Paul was accepted and eventually trusted by the Jerusalem Christians. 
thereby opening up Paul's extensive preaching ministry to the Gentiles, which, by the way, encompasses, well, there's more than that. Well, there's more than that. More than that. More than that. Uh, about that much. Uh, about Once Paul came to Christ, Barnabas made it a point to stand beside Paul and to encourage him and to put his encouraging words into action on Paul's behalf to publicly declare, despite the consequences, to publicly declare to the doubters and the skeptics that Paul was a changed man, that he had been changed by the Holy Spirit of God, by Jesus Christ himself, and that Paul needed to not only be accepted by the apostles as one of their own, but also that God, through Paul, would do wonders for Jesus Christ and his church. And my goodness, wasn't Barnabas correct? In today's lingo, Barnabas had Paul's back when Paul didn't deserve it. Paul was facing rejection and hatred for his past, and deservedly so. But still, Barnabas boldly approached the apostles and elders to stand up for Paul and to change, and the change that God made in Paul's life. See, a person with the gift of encouragement will stand with you even when it's not popular to do so, even when it may cost something extremely significant for that person. And this is the foundation of what it means to be a real Christian friend, a real Christian encourager, as opposed to a fair-weather friend. A genuine Christian friend helps out even when it comes at great personal cost. And isn't that what we as the body of Christ are called to do for other people, especially in this church? Support them, support each other, comfort each other, encourage each other, especially when somebody's going through tough times. There are people in this church going through tough times. Here this morning and those who can't be here. Times of fear, grief, worry, doubt, loneliness, anxiety. Depression. Yes, an encourager seeks to help others rather than hurt them. An encourager makes sacrifices for those in need. And the last point here, and it's brief, is an encourager is willing to give others a second chance. In Acts chapter 15, 36 to 39, we read this, quote, Sometime later, Paul said to Barnabas, let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them, but Paul did not think it wise to take him because Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Paul and Barnabas had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Now, I... <laughs> I can imagine what that was like. They didn't say, okay, no, I'm kidding. I, I can see him getting in each other's face, can't you? Sharp disagreement. What do you mean going back and forth? No, I, I, Barnabas, Paul, I stood up for you. No, 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 I don't care. I don't care. You know, Paul, no, no, no. He, he deserved it. You can imagine what that argument was like. Had such a sharp disagreement, they parted company. Barnabas took Mark and sailed for Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and left. Now, at that point in his life, think about this. John Mark's future in Christian ministry could have been ruined. It could have been dead as a doornail. If Barnabas had not been willing to embrace him and encourage him, Mark's reputation as a quitter could have been etched in stone. But, rather than labeling Mark as a quitter, Barnabas gives him another chance. Barnabas gives him another chance. Just as he gave Paul another chance. Another chance. A chance to redeem himself. And even though Paul had been 
given a second chance, Barnabas was not willing to do so, to, to, to do the, excuse me, and even though Paul had been given a second chance by Barnabas, Paul was not willing to do the same for John and Mark. Barnabas again sees the potential in someone who has failed in the past, and anyone who has read the Gospel of Mark is extremely grateful for that, Extremely grateful that Barnabas was that kind of encouraging friend. Why? Because without Barnabas, in all probability, we would not have the Gospel of Mark. Which was written by John Mark. Who was given a second chance by God through Barnabas. And by the way, the Gospel of Mark is considered by most scholars to be written around 50 A.D. and the very first Gospel written. And get this. Later on, even Paul decides that Barnabas was right about Mark. See, just, just before Paul is about to be executed in Rome, before he's about to be beheaded, he does what most people do. He wants to gather his family around. He wants to say goodbye. He wants to say, I'm sorry. He wants to say thank you. He wants to hear what they have to say to him. He wants to encourage them that he's going to a much better place. He wants his closest friends with him. He wants his family with him, right? And so he tells his protege, Timothy, quote, Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. <coughs> How about that? How about that? Right before he's about to be beheaded, one of his closest friends, one of those, a person whom he had come to trust and love, and depend upon a person who was so very helpful in Christian ministry was at one time a person that he said, I don't want to be around you anymore. My goodness, how God does wonderful things, doesn't he? So that's the story of Barnabas in a nutshell. He really was a great encourager, and he was a marvelous example of what a real Christian friend should be. But there's one even greater. He too is found in the Bible. And his encouragement and his friendship makes Barnabas pale in comparison. That encourager, that friend is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ who demonstrated his love for us by sacrificing himself on that brutal cross of Calvary. By pouring out his blood for us. For our forgiveness and our salvation. Romans 5, 6 to 8 tells us this. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died. Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, still sinners, Christ died for us. And it is this Christ who encourages us to encourage each other. Why? How? Why? Well, because that's how God speaks to us. That's what God wants for us. How? By number one, helping others rather than hurting them. Number two, making sacrifices for those in need. And number three, being willing to give others a second chance. And maybe a third. And maybe even a 
forward. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and the children of God say, Amen. Amen.